very nice of it. Even talking about this is uh, extremely interesting in the show. I quite a lot. I'm going to talk about something that you're already very familiar with, uh, the advice of the equilibrium. And I'd like to address more the indirect diffusion effect, which I'm going to explain what it is very soon. Um, this is based on some joint work with Clemens Fener, Vangelos Latus, and Wolfgang Praga, and all of them now are in that. Okay, so the main goal of my talk is to try to promote this thing. I, I hope that you may have seen it somewhere, but I, I don't think that it's just really written as a, like a sort of energy somewhere. So basically, uh, it's called the indirect diffusion effect, which is used in mostly in study the conversion to equilibrium. Maybe it could be used somewhere else, but we don't know yet. For um, in, in this talk, I'm going mostly talking about the application in reaction to the system coming out of chemistry uh, with degenerate diffusion. Okay, so I'm going to explain also what is degenerate diffusion. I mean, because they might have some different thing. Um, yeah, I'll start with some linear reaction just to see how the idea works, and then we. I'll come up with some more technical thing with the nonlinear reaction and some further applications. So I put here some words to try to attract your attention. Yeah, so, yeah. so entropy method, stronger inequality, low stronger inequality. Basically, it's like everything that you are all familiar with. Okay, so let's start already with the very easy, simple first order reactions. That you have a reversible reaction between some chemical species U and V. Basically, you you have a forward reaction and a backward reaction. Uh, with a linear rate and uh, the ratio rate constant for simplicity, I just put them to be one because it doesn't change analysis. So you can write down the system using, um, so like Ansgar's talk, uh, you using the the thick laws for diffusion. So basically, you get the Laplace linear Laplacian of uh, the diffusion for U and for V with different uh, uh, diffusion coefficients. For the reaction here, for instance, for instance, you, you see that the equation for u, you have minus u, it's basically the loss term curve. It is getting from the forward reaction, and the gain term plus v is this from the backward reaction. So it's just similar for v, so it's just a very simple system. To close it, we consider homogeneous boundary conditions, so nothing is really going out. Right? And, um, okay, so here one remark that the diffusion for u is, well, of course you can always switch them because they are symmetric, but Let's say the diffusion for u is always there, so it's strictly positive, the coefficient, but for v it could be zero. Okay, so when, when the v is zero, I say the system is having degenerate diffusion. Okay, so by degenerate diffusion, I mean that the system, um, not every species in the system is diffusing, but some of them might not diffuse. Okay, so that, that's what I meant by degenerate diffusion. For simplicity, I put the, the domain to have a unit volume, but it doesn't change analysis when you have general domain. Okay, so for this system, because of this uh, closed reaction, you have nothing going out, nothing going in, right? So you have expect the conservation of total mass. Basically, you just add up two equations, you see that the reaction disappears. You integrate in the, uh, space because of this homogeneous non boundary condition, the diffusion disappears. So basically, the sum of the mass is always a constant, which is equal to this initial total mass. So what we're looking at, because it's a chemical reaction, so we, we try to look at the chemical equilibrium. So I should say here, we already look at the constant state equilibrium. Right? So it is not the, the stationary state that we're looking at, but we specifically look at the constant equilibrium. Uh, so it's a chemical equilibrium, so you, you expect it to balance, uh, to, to balance the reaction. Right? So that means that at equilibrium, the, the reaction should be zero. That means that u infinity and v infinity, uh, v infinity should be zero. So that, that's the first equation here. But that doesn't give you a unique equilibrium. So you need to take into account also the, the mass conservation. Okay? So uh, using that, you can, you can have a unique one. In this case, it's like a trivial problem to solve it, and you get exactly this uh, form of equilibrium. But it doesn't really matter because we're not going to use it. Okay? So the main goal is to look at the last time behavior of the system, or more precisely the conversion to equilibrium, as to go to infinity. So it's a linear system, of course there are different ways to do it. Um, to my mind, the easiest way may be the Fourier analysis, but I'm going to use the entropy method because it's going to be extendable to also a uh, general framework. Okay, so entropy method. So everyone of you already familiar, so please uh, forgive me if I've given something too naive. 
Um, basically, I consider the relative entropy. In this case, it's a linear system, so you have the whole range of entropy functionals. So I choose the easiest one that, uh, that could be in my mind. That is the, the, the L2 uh, entropy. So the relative entropy is nothing else but the distance between the state and the equilibrium. Okay, then you can compute the entropy dissipation along the uh, trajectory, and then you uh, ended up with this entropy dissipation. So I color them in different uh, things. Funny thing though is it looks red now, right? Because of my slide it looks pretty. So, so it changes color. Anyway, um, so I have the contribution in the entropy dissipation is the summation of the blue part basically coming out of diffusion and the red part now is coming out of um, reaction okay so this this might play a uh, this will play a, an important role in my analysis later somehow. so like I mean I would like to have exponential convergence okay so I don't have polynomial decay so that's why I'm trying to prove some kind of linear entropy entropy dissipation estimate with some lambda that I hope to get it explicit but uh, warning that it's not optimal, and we don't know how to get optimal yet. Okay, um, so how do we do it? So, like I said, the, the entropy dissipation is the contribution of diffusion and reaction. So we look what what the diffusion do. So I mean, in general, in, in one way, the diffusion is trying always to push the concentration towards the uh, the average. Right. So somehow, by property inequality, you can control. The distance from the, the concentration to this average by this diffusion term. So that's the reason that we split the relative entropy into two parts, again with blue and red, where the blue one is basically the distance from the concentration to this average, and that we will control by that by the diffusion. And the red part now you see that is basically scalar because it's involving only the uh, averages of u and v. So it's not a function of quantity anymore, but it's just a scalar. Okay. That, that brings some advantages. Um, so for this linear system, everything is quite uh, easy to control this one by this two diffusion, by Sponger and Wittinger's inequality. Okay, it's already given also by Amit. Very uh, interesting insights. And for the red term now, basically you can use the fact that you can somehow, I mean, for this linear system, you can somehow replace a V bar by M minus U bar, then basically becomes like a scalar of just one quantity. And then you can do many things. So for instance, you combine this um, distance to averages with the reaction, so basically you get the, the distance between two averages. Okay, here of course you can see that uh, you can get only this to control this by sense sense inequality, right? But uh, I just want to put it here because it is really, for the linear system you don't use it, but for non-linear system it seems that it's impossible to to get such an estimate without a diffusion. And I want to address here the, the, the role of the diffusion because we're going to miss something. So that's why I want to put it here. And, and now, again, this one is just a scalar. So you can somehow reprove this by direct uh, computation. Okay, so in the end, you get this functional inequality. Um, so if you see here, we don't use any properties of solution, right? Nothing, really. And um, then you get this uh, functional inequality, which gives you the exponential decay of the relative entropy. But in this case, it's uh, already the distance between solution to equilibrium. So you get exponential conversion to equilibrium uh, in L2. Uh, and the constant lambda here is explicit because all the computation is explicit. Of course, it depending on the Poincaré, uh, Poincaré constant, but it's explicit in that sense. But it's, it's not optimal because it follows a series of, of estimates and we don't know how to optimize it globally. Okay, so now the case when we have Bayesian rate diffusion. So I repeat the, the arguments that I did here, basically that we use this uh, Poincaré inequality, this Poincaré inequality, and this triangle inequality. Now because of this one, we're missing this, okay, now this is real, real uh, red, and now it becomes some kind of pink. Okay, <laughs> so now we're really missing this diffusion from V, and we also don't have this in the, in the combination here. So what, what is called an indirect diffusion effect? But we still hope to have some conversion to equilibrium. Uh, I just tried to write it in the um, matrix form here, just to relate somehow to Anton's talk, that you have basically, of course it's, it's not an ODE, it's a PTE, but if you look at the matrix, so uh, this matrix is, is positive semi-definite, but it's not strictly uh, positive definite. 
And uh, this one is basically the conservative part, right? So if you sum up the row, it is zero, so it gives you the conservation mass. So now, basically, we look somehow like the interaction between this, and we hope to get some kind of uh, the, the global convergence in the end. Okay, so what do we really want, right? So what do we really want to get to get the entropy entropy dissipation estimate to work? So if we look here, that we want this term <coughs> and we want this term. Basically, they're the same. So that is the wanted guy. Okay, so I, I'm trying all my best to get that one. Uh, in this case, I didn't have to try my best because it's quite easy. So you can uh, prove that if you combine this term, which is coming out of diffusion from U, and the reversible bit, uh, ratio between U and B, you get basically the, well, the guy. It actually is just one half, it's very nice. The proof is extremely easy, just one line, I put it here. First, you try the inequality here, this one because of uh, the orthogonal between this and this, and you get this one, this one. So, it's a proof is easy. Uh, what is the consequence of this? So, if you look again at this inequality, what do we get? That if we combine the diffusion from U, this one is not the real diffusion, but it's actually coming out diffusion from U, and you combine with the reversible with reaction between U and B, you get some term, that is usually, usually controlled by diffusion. But of course, in this case, we don't have the diffusion. Right? So we cannot control it directly from diffusion, but we still can control this, so that's why we call it some kind of diffusion effect. Okay, so it's not the real diffusion of V, but some kind of diffusion effect for V. So that is, that is what's called the indirect diffusion effect for in our mind now. So we combine diffusion of some species, we combine it with a reversible reaction between that species and some other species, and then we get, in the end, some diffusion effect on, on the species, which is not diffusing. And of course, uh, that intuition is quite, I think it's quite intuitively clear, because you have some particles, it's like diffusing, so it's moving like randomly as a random work, right? And this is reacting with the others. So even though the other is not working randomly, but because of the reversible reaction, it looks like it tra uh, it's traveling randomly, because of all the reaction all the time. So what we did is actually we put that in the functional uh, inequality, and moreover, it's in a quantitative form. Okay, so basically what we got in the end is that we have, even though for this, there's a rate diffusion system, uh, we get exponential conversion to equilibrium with a different rate than lambda. Now it's mu, and supposedly <laughs> it's smaller than lambda. Um, uh, maybe a, a, a general question to ask that we say that the diffu uh, diffusion effect that is basically distant from B to B bar is getting transferred. So maybe we say, okay, what else is transferred, right? So we don't know in general. But uh, I, I, I thought from the beginning very nicely, maybe we can get some smoothness. But I mean, at first glance, it seems hopeless. Because if you look at the equation for V, it's basically ODE. Right? So you can never get regular, more regular than V0, basically. So the smoothness, at the first glance, is not transferring. Maybe in some other sense, but. I have not looked into that very closely. A little bit more um, deeper into this functional inequality, like I said, we didn't really use the diffusion from U, but we use only the diffusion effect from U, actually. So once you get the diffusion effect from V, you can use that again to maybe transfer to further species when you have a system with more species just than just one, two. So here I thought maybe... <coughs> so chemical ratio network, first order, but it's weakly reversible in the sense that if you look at this as a graph, uh, so it's strongly connected. Okay, so that means every um, from every vertex you can go to any other vertex by a very long way, supposedly. And for this one, because of this indirect diffusion effect, just if, if one of them is diffusing, then you get the diffusion effect for all the others in the network. Okay, so we have this functional inequality, which is quite intuitively clear. So basically, we could do that in the, in the most general way. Okay, uh, before going to nonlinear system, I'd like to mention the relation to some other phenomenon. Basically, when we, we have that, when we try to think, uh, well, what does it really mean, right? So uh, basically, there are some similar, let's say, not mechanism to philosophy I find is common with other things. So first is so with hypercursivity, or more especially, I mean is by this focal plan equation, you, you have heard a lot about in Anton's talk already, right? So you have some degenerate diffusion in this sense, and the interaction between this degenerate diffusion and linear drift gives you, again, the exponential conversion to equilibrium. 
in suitable sense or in suitable norm in that case. The second thing, actually, I was told by Laurent de Villet, thank you very much, um, but I haven't really looked at into detail, so please forgive my clumsy here. This is called something called Kawashima's condition in hyperbolic variable equations or systems. So look at this system, basically f is a vector, right? And you have this probabilistic part, and here is this hyperbolic part, uh, first order hyperbolic part. And this probabilistic part, again, is not strictly dissipative, but just dissipative, right? But somehow, if you have some, well, very strange interaction between these two parts, probabilistic one and hyperbolic one, you get the k of the, the system. Of course, in this case, not exponential, but polynomial, okay? So this one is somehow in my mind, I don't have fully understand it yet, what does it mean? But in my mind, it's basically the, the suitable interaction between these two parts. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is something called the noise stabilization. So basically, if you look at the very easy linear um, uh, ODE, the dx equal to uh, Ax, with A, with A is a trace negative. So remember the trace negative, but A may have positive eigenvalues. It's just that the sum of all eigenvalues is negative, but it might have many positive eigenvalues. So at the deterministic level, it might be exponentially unstable. But if you put in somehow the linear multiplicative noise with some very easy uh, Wiener process here, then you see that if you choose alpha large enough, actually you gain again the exponential decay of the solution. So basically. Uh, it has to stabilize the system, even so the, the system, but the, the original one is not stable at, at the first place. Okay, so all of this and with the indirect diffusion effect, to my mind, it has a common philosophy. Basically, you have a system, you have some partial dissipate, dissipation in some sense, either in some directions or either in some species, and then you have some other uh, operations and you, you need what you need is really the suitable mixing between these. So it's always mixing and, and the mixing in a suitable, then in the end you get global decay of the whole the whole system. Okay, so let's now move on to uh, nonlinear system because the linear one uh, the linear analysis seems uh, straightforward. So we consider a more general reversible reaction. Now we pay a uh, p molecules of v uh, of u sorry and Q molecules of V. So you can write out again the system with linear diffusion, but now the reaction is nonlinear in this sense. Okay? So it, they have part, this particular form because you use the, the mass action law in, in chemistry. So for this one, you still have the total conservation of mass with the different weight now or the, the different uh, coefficient now. Uh, and you also have unique <coughs> chemical equilibrium. In this case, not explicit anymore, but like I mentioned before, it doesn't really matter. So what we try uh, again for this one again is a reversible reaction. So expect um, you expect it also to converge to equilibrium, right? also exponentially. So we try to look at also the, the entropy method. And since it's a nonlinear system, you don't have the whole range of entropy function anymore. The only yeah, it seems that the only suitable thing is uh, the Boltzmann entropy. So we, that's exactly what we use. So we use uh, the relative Boltzmann entropy. I missed the Boltzmann first. Sorry. Here, basically, is the relative Boltzmann entropy between the concentration and the equilibrium. And you can compute again the entropy dissipation. Again, it's the contribution of diffusion and reaction in different colors. But now the diffusion is represented in this entropy dissipation, by, not by the L2 norm or the gradient, but by efficient formation. Okay? And the reaction is now in this form, so it's not the L2 norm, uh, it's not the L2, the nice L2 structure anymore. Anyway, you can still try to mimic the idea from the linear setting because you know that for this one you don't use Congre but you use uh, lower big silver left inequality. So that's why you split this relative entropy into two parts, the blue one, which we control by the blue one from D, and uh, the rest, which is again a scalar. Okay, so uh, for the blue one I use lower big silver left inequality to control both terms from U and V. There's nothing really um, the main work is actually to estimate uh, E2, and I remember the first work on this was done by Laurent and Clemens in 2006 with the long calculations using many different properties of solution. So over time it's getting both, and until now we have a kind of general way how to get these estimates. Of course it, it, it looks like four lines, but in, 
it could be four pages or more than that. But in the end, somehow, the main uh, effort is trying to put the averages inside the integral. So basically, to bring it from the functional, uh, functional quantity to a scalar quantity in an explicit way. Okay, there, are, there are different ideas to get it, but in a non-explicit way, and we don't want that. Okay, in the end, we can, you can also prove this again with some also standard uh, estimates. So basically, now we control both parts, right? The so blue part and the E2. So we get the functional equality for U and V. Of course, you have to take into account the, the mass conservation, otherwise not working. The remark I want to make here is that we do this one without any extra regularity assumptions for U and V. The only thing we require is this. So basically, L1 function is enough. Of course, when it's, it's not, uh, this one is infinity, and D is infinity, then of course it's true. Okay? So, so this one is real functional inequality without using any extra conditions uh, on the solution. That's a good thing because it's quite flexible that we can apply it to many different situations. Um, the one that I mentioned here is the volume coupling surface system, but I won't go into detail. It's just saying that now you have the concentration U is inside omega, but the concentration V is only on the boundary. So you have like a surface equation coupling with the volume equation through a reaction, and you can do again the, um, the entropy method, and in the end you get again the exponential decay. I should mention here that with this one, you have exponential decay of the entropy first, right? But then we see that kuhn pinsker inequality, you get the exponential decay of the solution to equilibrium. Now in L1 or not in L2 anymore. Okay, so let's go to the interesting case when we have tertiary diffusion. Okay, so now we're missing the diffusion from B. So basically we miss this, this inequality and we miss this term in this estimate. I should mention here that this term plays an important role in this estimate. Un unlike the linear case, where you can basically forget about this to estimate, in the nonlinear it seems unavoidable to use it. Okay? So now we're missing both of them in both estimates. Okay? So again we try to mimic like the indirect diffusion effect, try to get the diffusion from U combining with the reaction between U and V to get some kind of this indirect diffusion effect. Well, can we do this? Um, my short answer is we don't know. Unconditionally. So we, if we can do this without any extra regularity on U and V, we're great. We don't know how to do it yet. But conditionally, we can. Under the conditions that we know the L infinity bounds of U and V is actually finite or bounded. Of course, later we need that to be uniformly bounded for all solutions of the, of, of the system. So, um, but we, actually, we didn't really prove this one directly, but we proved somehow a weaker version. Like I said, the structure here is a little bit more complicated because of not the L2 settings, right? so it's not really <coughs> easy to use. So we try again to bring it back to L2 settings by writing this, for example, like efficient formation as a gradient of square root, and then this term use some elementary inequality. So in the end, what we get here we get here, it looks a little bit like a boundary inequality, but now for the square root of v. So we, what we control is this term, what we wanted is this term. So you see that if you expand it, it grows like linear in v, while here is super linear in v. But remember, we, we assume some L infinity bounds, right? So actually, you can control this term. Uh, you can control this term by this term in the end, using this, this bound. Okay, so that is what what we can do now for indirect diffusion effect is in the nonlinear settings, so and I just rewrite by using the big U and big V for square root. So you combine the diffusion effect for the big U, you combine with reversible reaction between U and V in a nonlinear way, then you get some kind of indirect diffusion effect for, for big V in this suitable sense. Of course, there we have to use also conservation mass. So basically, of course, this one, again, uh, I should go back here that we, we assume this the infinity bound. Luckily, for this sy particular system, we can get it. For more general, we don't know. Even with full diffusion, it's a very hard question to get the infinity bound. Luckily, for this system, we can do it with some uh, uh, direct estimates. And uh, basically, we get the theorem that even though without uh, diffusion from V, we still can prove some um, entropy and dissipation estimate now is depending on the L infinity bound, so it's not uh, 
real functional inequality in the sense that it satisfies for all functions, right? Uh, but I mean, for this particular system, we can do it. And from here, you get again exponential decay of energy entropy, and then you get the, the decay of solution. Okay. Uh, yeah, so before I conclude, I'd like to point out that this one is not only used in our problem for chemical reaction, but also used in different situations where basically you have bacterial diffusion. The first one I'd like to mention is the work of Laurent de Blay and Clarence Fenner, where they consider coagulation fermentation with diffusion now dif depending on the size of the cluster. So um, intuitively, when you have a cluster that has a very long size, so size is very long, you don't expect it to diffuse too much, right? And that's why uh, when y goes to infinity, this diffusion coefficient is somehow breaks it down. So you cannot use it for, for y is very large. So what, what they do, what I understood, that somehow they use the diffusion for small size, where you have strictly lower bound for this term, to compensate somehow the diffusion effect for the longer size. Uh, combining it with the uh, coagulation fermentation processes. Okay. So that is some kind of indirect diffusion effect. Um, there is another application that we consider again, the, okay, again, chemical reactions, but now not with linear diffusion, but with non-linear diffusion, or more precisely, um, cross-medium equations. So we have the mi here is, is strictly bigger than one, so it's not like smaller than one like the front class talk, but it's bigger than one. So when ui is very small, then the diffusion is some some some. Uh, it looks like pressure rate because you don't have the diffusion effect there. <coughs> um, so what we have to do is we have to compensate when u i is more, then we have to compensate it with some u j, which is not small. And because some of the mass conservation, uh, they cannot be all small at the same time. Right? So at least one of them or many of them should be should be large at one time. So we can compensate it. To, uh, we can use it to compensate the small diffusion at the place. The last one is uh, the application in the model from uh, semiconductors and you have uh, the system of the electrons, the holes, and here the trapped state. So the trapped state you don't have any diffusion at all. Okay, but for the last time behavior you still can show it by entropy method by compens compensating um, the diffusion effect from the diffusion from the ele electrons and the hole and the reaction between those. Okay, so let me conclude that I, I could do the indirect diffusion effect in a linear setting in a very easy way, somehow, straightforward. Not optimal yet, but straightforward. We have some conditional uh, results in a non-linear settings. Okay? So there are many open questions you can see. I have presented only very specific questions, very specific uh, systems. Right? So you can think of trying to do it in a much more general framework. For instance, the first question is, can we get can we get this one un un unconditionally? Yeah, to, to my, I don't even know if it's true. So I believe it's true. Kevin said maybe not. So we don't know. If you have an answer, please tell me. Um, so the next one is to extend to more general reactions. The first one I'd like to look is this reversible reaction because it's binary, quadratic, nonlinear. But it's, it looks, uh, it's kind of fundamental in, in many uh, chemical reactions. Um, and uh, the last one maybe is a little bit ambitious to further to see the connections between this kind of effect to the phenomenon that I mentioned before, like high cohesivity, to the Kawashima's condition, and maybe to noise stabilization. Maybe they could, they could be the same phenomena for the much more general framework, but in special case it turns out to be one of the same, but, but I don't know. So that's all I want to present. Thank you very much. I was wondering, and hypercausality, the trick somehow is that you construct a different function and it just decay. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in your case, I guess you kind of limited of the functions you can consider by yeah. the reaction, reaction terms. But are there any other functions you can think of than the, other than the relative entropy which are decaying under this reaction, uh, reversible reactions? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, for linear system, I, I say that maybe. For nonlinear system, the point is, at least to me, 
uh, you can find many different Lyapunov really functions. But really, for the conversion to equilibrium, this, is, this seems that Boltzmann equation is the most suitable one. And I will also go on and tell you a little bit more that for the, the reason they have the exact entropy for that, because you can formally derive the reaction dividend system for one of the reactive Boltzmann systems. So the entropy structure is actually getting propagated to the macroscopic limit. So that is uh, the most suitable one. I, I have no idea if, if there are different functional uh, in this case, but it's related to diff uh, so it's not just one function, but it relates to two functions, for instance. Yeah, but it, it might be, yeah, it might be worth looking at, but I, I don't know, to be honest, I have no idea. Um, I don't know if this really makes any sense, but do you know what happens to the second derivatives of your entropy? Yeah, that uh, actually yeah, I tried to do with Amit, even with the full diffusion case. So when you look at the linear uh, proof, the linear system, we try to prove, uh, yeah, try to prove the exponential conversion to equilibrium here. Everything is nice, uh, but uh, the rate is not uh, optimal. Yeah. So basically, uh, even in, with the full linear diffusion here, you can try to do back memory estimate uh, strategy. Look at the second derivative of entropy. Unfortunately, when you do that, there are some mixing between diffusion and reaction that we don't know how to control. So I heard Clemens told me that he tried. I mean, he, he told me the answer, you try too. <laughs> and I and Amit also trying, blindly not, not trying not to know that the, the, the great has done it, but we couldn't succeed. So basically, for the next derivative, there are some very weird mixing between the diffusion and reaction that we have no idea how to control in a reasonable way. So dv equal to zero, are there also singular perturbation results available? Uh, what, what kind of perturbation? The second diffusion coefficient to zero. I yeah. could also think about putting it to epsilon and letting epsilon go into zero. Are there, in certain cases, singular perturbation results available? Um, no, I, I don't think uh, someone has done it. Um, yeah, that's actually yeah, that's the the, the good way how to uh, maybe how to relate the, the 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 rate lambda here. Of course, when that epsilon lambda might be zero epsilon. Yeah. So it's it's good to to, to maybe com compare the lambda to the mu here when 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 epsilon goes to zero. I, I believe it's it's doable, especially for the linear system. I'm sure that it's doable, but I, I don't know for non-linear system. Um, yeah, because if you because in the nonlinear system, the, the estimate is going through a lot of uh, steps. So maybe when we look closely into that, we can control the dead dependence on epsilon. But at the moment, I cannot give a very good answer. OK, so the next thing power again. And I think we're going to go to the next slide. Yes. Yeah.